Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about the Unify Dream Machine Pro. If you want to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire short a project, there's a Hire Us button up at the top. If you want to support the channel out in other ways, there are affiliate links down below for deals and services that we talk about on this channel. And right now, the Dream Machine Pro. A lot of people are asking me about this as soon as it came out. And the folks at Ubiquity were nice enough to send me one, and I've spent a few days testing it here. Uh, maybe, maybe even close to a week. Got it almost a week ago. Anyways, I really like it. We're going to talk about some of the details with it. It is definitely a step up from the previous, like the USG. It is a pro version, much like its namesake is, um, that it's compared to the Unified Dream Machine, one I, cylinder one that I just did a follow-up review on earlier today, and the Dream Machine Pro here. So I'm happy they sent it to me, but I still am going to be critical of it because there is people that say, well, you know, well, Tom, they sent it to you, so you're just going to say nice things about them. Well, yes, no. We're going to talk about some of his shortcomings, and it still has some. But we'll talk about the hardware first because I already have it taken apart, and the shortcomings are all software, so I always hold hope that the, any problems that I refer to in this will be resolved. That's the beauty of software-defined networking. All right, so looking at the hardware here, and this is a little tricky to show just on the overhead, so I want to show it like this. Um, we have a lot of thought going into the design and how airflow works. So we have this over here and we have the fan pulls in air and then we have this heatsink for the main processor and everything that's, uh, I'm assuming underneath this, I'm not taking it apart. And I'll get a closer look at it in a second. But that has a thermal pad on it. So we got a nice metal heat sink and fan uh, combo here, blowing the air over, pulling and cooling, going up this plenum across here and it distributes the air, and this is all really nicely smooth plenum over here. We have another fan here to pull heat away from the hard drive, and the back of this is a little bit lower than the front. So when we put the lid on, you have this gap all the way across for the air to kind of flow out and kind of nice even. So it's not flowing out of one spot, it kind of spreads across. What makes it spread across is, you can kind of see in here, there's just a slit all the way across the back. So it actually closes this off a little bit, but then it's distributed along that slit in the back uh, to kind of give you a nice even airflow. Now the device is really quiet. That much we'll give them. That They did a nice job on that. And uh, the hard drive right here, this is actually optional. All the storage and everything is all saved on the board for the operating system, the updates, and where all that is is on the board. The storage here is because they've also thrown in for those of you that have probably already read, read ahead on this, yes, that has Unify Protect on there, as well as a few other new up and coming things from Unify. I'll mention those when we get to the software, but I'm not specifically reviewing Protect again. Um, that'll be coming at a future date because that's it's still a separate video because there's multiple ways to run Protect. And I'll be probably testing it on this particular device. Now, always there's uh, someone may point out why all the empty space. And that is one thing about the device that uh, is kind of a shortcoming. And I'll talk a little bit of shortcomings right now. One of them is that we only have a spot for one drive. So having only a single drive in here means a limits to the amount of storage you can have on some of the cameras and no redundancy for the cameras. So if something were to happen to one drive, all that footage would go away with it. So those are still concerns when you have just a single point of failure inside of here for that, or only having one drive and not being able to raid them together into some performance, uh, gain some, have some performance gains in them. Obviously there's limitations to how many cameras you can hook up before that many cameras can't write at the speed the drive can't handle the data. You can see there's gonna be some collisions there. Now, my overall on this, like I said, I like I do like the device, but it's still, when it comes to those little shortcomings like that, means it's a little bit harder sell to say this is a higher end business oriented device. But what I say some home users would dramatically benefit from this. And I've seen people say, well, rack mount stuff's not for home users. And I would say, yes, it very much is. I've talked to many new home builders now, and this is probably a pretty ideal device. And I think that maybe probably where they were going as far as targets. Uh, some of these newer home builders that we've consulted with, they are putting smaller, but racks in certain areas, maybe in the basement or somewhere where they have all the AV equipment. And this is an important feature to them is they have a several rack mounted things, maybe some AV equipment combined with, they need some, you know, fast internet routing combined with Wi-Fi spread out through the house. This Unify makes that really easy and the controller is all located here. They don't have to deal with any hosting of it. And that's something really nice that Unify offers is the fact that, well, 
the whole cloud key, everything here. They can hand the new homeowner, here's the login and password and you know transfer it to them and away you go. They set it up, they configure it, they have the Wi-Fi configured in their house. And when you think about it from that aspect, it actually makes a lot of sense. The device, you know, the homeowner's gonna have just a few cameras probably um, and maybe the door access control, things like that, pretty good. Where it falls short on business is of course, this has you know a little bit better than the standard USG and definitely faster routing speeds, but still no ability to do multiple IPs on a single WAN port. That's obviously a common use case we have in business, but we're not seeing that still in this particular version of the software here in February of 2020 that's on here. All right, now let's look at the overhead and get a little closer look at some of the parts on here. So here's like a direct overhead of that plenum. Like I said, it's really machined. Everything's done real smooth. It doesn't, uh, it's all nice and tight in here. And the board's nice, clean, installed. Nothing, nothing particular spectacular about it, but it looks nice and they did a good job here. I don't see anything unusual other than that little bit of empty space. Like I said, could have filled it with our hard drive, but I'm nitpicking, and, but I know people are gonna ask. Um, so this is the controller for the little front display. It has a front display like the uh, Gen 2 series switches do. And then we have the power supply here. So pretty simple, uh, plugs into the uh, 120 volt. Now let's uh, look at the ports on it. So we have the eight ports here. So your standard eight LAN ports. You have a one gig WAN port a WAN 2 as it's labeled for your 10 gig SFP plus port and a LAN that's at 10 gig SFP plus and then a reset button here. I'll get a closer look up of the display once it's booting up and then we have the hard drive here which uh, pretty straightforward how that just snaps in and slides out. Now the one thing I'll say is right here is how far you push it in and it's hard to show but what you have to be careful of is this. I can actually push it in too far. It's actually seated perfectly fine at the back here, but now the door won't close because the door is past the little spot we're supposed to grab. Now you can slide this out if you make that mistake. It's not too big of a deal, but you push it in until it starts to stop and then do that. I just noticed that when I was putting it in, because I when I first had it, I was like, oh, and I was holding it and I slid it in. If you just drop the hard drive in while it's in the odd position, such as this, uh, the hard drive will go right past. I'm like, I, I didn't want to push it. And I'm like, oh, that could be a problem because I don't know what would happen if it levered too hard, but um, I, it may crack something. It doesn't feel flimsy or anything. It's just a matter of you got to be careful because it, like right here, it, yeah, it'll snap past there. So push it in gently. Just a little comment on there, it goes in perfectly fine. Feels well made, it's metal, so it slides in and it lines up the rails. All right, now let's dive into the software because that's where the real questions begin. This is, you know, as fancy as it looks, uh, how does it perform, how does the software work, and what does it look like when you do a 10 gig test? Well, I'm gonna answer all those questions right now after I get the lid back on. I'll fast forward this, no one wants to watch me fiddle with the lid. Now, in case anyone's wondering, it did come with rack ears and a screw kit, including screws to mount the hard drive in here. So uh, they did include everything in terms of that. So no problems, no issues, couple rack nuts as well. It's, I, I actually had mixed these up prior with the ones for the Gen 2 switch that's behind me. And I was noticing there's extra screws and it's because I opened both boxes and the harder kits are almost identical, um, except for the fact that there's a few more screws that come with the Dream Machine. So I had actually thought there were extra screws with the Gen 2, for those of you that watched that video, that was my mistake. They just shipped the extra screws with this. As soon as I put the hard drive in this, I had realized that my mistake. Um, but nonetheless, the I like the way you, they are putting together with Ubiquiti, the uh, hardware kits for these the screws and everything. They're nice, it's kind of like the soft foam. Matter of fact, they don't just fall out. So even if you drop them here, things don't just flop around. So they did a nice job on it. All right, let's boot this thing up. So the system's all up and running and we have settings. We can change the brightness, the color, and uh, a few other settings that we have in here. There's the fan speed. And it works like it does on the Gen 2 switches where you can swipe up or down, it's you know touch enabled. About, we can see the system load, memory usage, WAN, no IP yet, so waiting for it to start up and get an IP. Temperature, uptime, just turned it on. Board revision, UDM Pro version, it says it's up to date. Now, other network settings are in here as well, so we have what speed we're doing Wi-Fi experience, uh, clients that are connected to it, wireless guest, and once again that. And then finally we have 
the protect. Now I loaded it, but didn't set it up. So it would let me know how many cameras, motion events, and things like that. I, I really do like having this little display on there because you just get such a quick, clear picture of uh, settings and things like that on here. So I, I definitely like this as a feature. Definitely pretty cool. So the Unify Dream Machine Pro is plugged in up and running at 10 gig on both the LAN and WAN 2. So this is plugged into the WAN port. It is a QT SFP 10 GT, which this is, is a SFP plus 10 gig connector plugged into that top SFP plus port for 10 gig connectivity with an RJ45. And this is accurate. It says no WAN IP because the WAN IP is the RJ45 port. The SFP port, SFP plus port is the 10 gig port labeled as WAN 2. So the IP address just doesn't show on there. So I thought that was uh, of note. But the bottom cable is a DAC cable plugged in, as you better picture here, that goes to a Gen 2 Pro Switch 24 port that also has a 10 gig connector on DAC. So we have a DAC cable there, RJ45 that comes from the back of our office where we have 10 gig RJ45 over CAT 6A. But I just wanted to like show the connections that are on there. And like I said, the display, I'm sure it's something easy enough for them to update in software, but if you're using this connection, it will not display the WAN IP in the little uh, front panel menu. Now over here, we have unify.ui.com slash dashboard where the LTS demo UDM Pro shows up. I did not do, but Chris covered it and watched his video as well. I'm pretty sure you have already. Uh, the Unify Dream Machine Pro video he did, he shows the fact that yes, you have to register with Unify. You have to have a, an account registered with them or it gives you the option on the fly to create one. Now, this may be a deal breaker for some people, that's fine, but this is not any official way that you can get around this. When you set this up, it wants to register and tie itself to the Unify portal where you can launch and get into it from here. Now, interesting enough, if you go here to network.unify.com, that's where all the other things, the other cloud keys and other software-defined network controllers are registered here, including the Dream Machine. Dream Machine Pro seems to have its own dashboard at just Unify dot ui.com so my guess is that you've just kind of moved things over to here so closing that out i will start on the software here i did the hardware yesterday the software today is 21 hours later ever since i plugged it in i just wanted to leave it running for a while and well i ran out of time yesterday to finish the video so uh it's Idling in the office with an ambient temperature i was probably about 70 in our office roughly um we're sitting here well 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and this is idling at 35 degrees centigrade. So not too hot, not too loud, um, no real problems there. 10% CPU load, storage, and uh, move my head out of the way. It shows the storage for hard drive two, which is the hard drive we plugged in for Unify Protect. And this is where you set up the actual applications. By default, the only thing installed was the Unify Software Defined Networking Controller here. And then we have Protect, Access, and Talk. I may do separate videos on those later. I've done one on Protect before, um, but right now I don't have anything really to set up or know much about the Access and Talk features. But, you know, these are obviously actually cool add-ons that this box has. So it's got some future potential um, as products come out related to this and development continues. The Protect is pretty neat. Um, having this all integrated and kind of reinforces, like I said, a small home office or a small office. This would be a pretty nice thing for, for people. Just a few cameras uh, with only a single hard drive in there, but it's nice that that's integrated. And for geofencing purposes, this is a feature of Protect. You set that inside of here so you'd say where the location is. And there's some features that Protect has that change the alert information based on location. I do have SSH turned on, so I'm going to be doing part of this demo by SSHing into the box itself to show some of the back end of the software. Then we have restart device and factory reset. And please note, I'm doing all this and there's not any SSL error because of the way the portal launches it. Um, it takes care of all that for you. If you are inside the network, and right now from my position, I'm outside the network uh, on a different network with this computer than the network is in the studio, that allows this to, you can access it locally if you're on there, but you're going to get the you know errors. But if you just launch it from the portal, whether you're remote or local to it, it's nice because you don't have to click through those errors, which some browsers have a little bit of problems with with the latest round of updates. But thought I'd mention that. Also, the factory reset button here. One concern I had, but they have a page on this. I like this. Unify Dream Machine Emergency Recovery for both the UDM and UDM Pro. They have a process by which you can master reset these. Um, 
and it says specifically not the usual plug-in computer to a static of 1.20, which is common for a lot of the older unified devices. This sets to 1.30 for the recovery mode screen when you hold the reset in, and it kind of brings it back to this. Without it having any USB, I was curious about how this could happen. Like if, for some reason, it got corrupted or it was some problem, they do have a help article here of how to reset these into like an emergency. Somehow you goof up the settings to the point of no return. They got a way to return. So back onto the software. Speak a little thing at the top here, and we're going to go over to Obviously, you see we can select the other services, but we're just going to cover this one here, the Unify Software Defined Networking Controller. And this is uh, pretty much the same as the Unify Software. So I'm not going to dive real deep into it, but it works well. Like it's the same software we're used to. I didn't see any major changes or differences. Uh, we will show that I do have a couple things. I'll move myself over to here real quick. Uh, a couple things behind here, a couple devices connected, the XEPNG server. I have a uh, Debian behind the UDM. I don't know what that device is, something else we have plugged in, and the Unify AP Nano HD along with the Unify Switch 24 Pro. So PoE. So this does not have PoE, so we wanted to plug a PoE switch in. And of course, the question comes up, can you adopt other things after? Yes, adopt away. Um, it, like I said, is the full Unify software. So let's run down here through the settings. Pretty much, like I said, nothing... Uh, groundbreaking. There's not much here that is different than the standard fi standard Unify SDN controller. So that's nice because it's a comfortable environment for me because I know where all these buttons are and I know what they all do. Um, and we'll run down here. Now, the first thing, provider capabilities. It does ask for a speed test when you are first setting it up. I let it do the speed test and then I went here and set it to uh, 15 gig and 15 gig. You can always update it again and pre-populate it from rerunning the test again. But the reason I did this is because we're going to create some synthetic benchmarks. I didn't want any of the queuing or slowing down of things to happen because of settings inside of here. Now, the reason it does that is because packet queuing and proper traffic management, traffic shaping, quality of service occurs first by knowing what the speed of the connection is and then adjusting the queues accordingly. Uh, and like I said, we don't want to do that because I wanted to do a speed test to see what it can route at because my internet may not be the same speed as your internet. And if your internet's faster than mine and I only showed you how fast it can route with my internet, it wouldn't be a real satisfactory answer for a lot of people. I get that. Now, we also have the LED and screen settings right here. Uh, this shows up when you have devices that have the ability to adjust things like the screen brightness, such as in the Pro 2, uh, Gen 2 Pro server that has a display on there. And of course, this is the display that is right on the device itself, where you can even turn this off. So that is a little bit different that you may not see in a normal unified software defined network controller. So it has the ability to create other wireless networks. So you can have multiple LANs on there. I did go ahead and create one test VLAN and a LAN here, WAN, WAN2. Routing and firewall is the same. One thing I'll note, if you go over here to port forwarding, I have these couple servers that we're going to SSH into that are behind it. When you're in here, the WAN2 interface shows up here. But well, let's click edit real quick to give you an idea. So I can choose WAN2 or both. So WAN, WAN2 are both when you're doing a port forward. It wants to know what WAN interface the forward should go to. If we go to the new settings, the which is in beta, I will comment because this is just something that some people have got a little bit hung up on occasionally. But when you're doing, I do like the search, don't get me wrong. Whoops. I do like that I can jump over here and say port forward and jump right to the menu. But when I try to edit this, it doesn't have an option for WAN 2 yet as of this software version that they're running on here. So... It's still missing that. Um, I have to do it from the other side because I'm using WAN too. If not, it's defaulting the port forwards only onto WAN. So we'll just keep and stick with the other menu. Although these menus, like with the search at the top and you add a lot of menus, I do like it. It's a little faster, but until they have all the features in there, we'll have to do it this way. Now, threat management. Right here on threat management, I have everything turned full on. Obviously, if you've looked at this menu, I will actually jump back to the way it looks on here. If we use security and we say threat management, much nicer looking menu here. We can just choose levels and adjust these things, and then you can dive down. They just grouped everything together. It'll be a little bit, you know, a little bit easier to find and navigate the things you want to make sure you're monitoring for threat management on. Uh, but this is kind of nice. GOIP filtering's in here, DNS filtering, alpha filter. I added one for adult filtering, but when you add the filters, it's pretty basic and doesn't seem to really have 
a lot. Like I don't have customization and I don't even know what adult sites it's listing. It just kind of adds them, but it doesn't give us a whole lot of detail on that. So I don't have like a lot of insight into it when we turn this on or off. Yeah, I wish I, this, it's cool they have it. To me, this is the very beginnings of it. And of course it does say alpha. Deep packet inspection. So this is enabled along with device fingerprinting. It tries to identify the devices on the network and the deep packet inspection tries to make some determinations as to where the traffic is going, YouTube, Facebook, social media sites, etc., and create some definitions around that. Network scanners is kind of interesting. So endpoint scanner and internal honeypot. I mentioned this, this was also built into the unified dream machine. And of course, again, the dream machine pro, they seem to run the same software essentially. The Threat management dashboard can do an endpoint scan and determine if endpoints that it has on the network have open ports. It scans apparently periodically for that. Not a lot of information from Unify about this. Nothing I've seen at least. Uh, maybe someone can link me to if they have posted an article about it, but it just goes around scanning and make a list and says, hey, I found these ports open on these endpoints on the LAN side of your network. Uh, internal honeypot, it lets you build a honeypot on the LAN side either one, either, either the let test LAN that I created, which is a VLAN, but on there, you give the honeypot an IP and then it listens for things to try to attach to it. And if you're not sure exactly how honeypots work, they are kind of dummy systems you'll set up and you sometimes will do them for research and put them on the greater internet, but internally they can be used as when someone goes on your network and starts scanning it and they are getting into the honeypot, you will be notified and you like to know when something's on your network scanning that you weren't the one initiating. So you're probably not going to scan your own honeypot, but if someone does scan it, you know that endpoint for some reason is scanning the network and it gives you a reason to investigate. So kind of neat that they're building that in there. I think that's kind of a, I hope to see more around that get built. Has IP tepu, uh, reputation, restrict access for, to malicious IPs, is pulling lists for that. Uh, you can create new threat management whitelists and signature suppression based on that. So it's got a few options, direction both, tracked by IP address subnet, and then do some blocking and listing in there. Firewall features, well, we got all the rules in here and everything else. So groups, uh, what else do we have? Contract modules, state timeouts, so you get some tuning in here, and action logging. Oops. Open that up, scroll down a little more. WAN rules, LAN rules, guest rules, so you can do some of the logging on there. VPN server and VPN connections. I still wish they had a more robust VPN set up for the USG line. They do have the create unified to unify VPN. That's a feature I really like. So connecting two sites together, Unify's done a good job and makes that easy between two different unified devices. When it comes to creating VPN servers, not so much. The only thing we're showing here when we use the advanced mode is an L2TP server. We go over here to classic mode. Actually, got to close out of this. Leave. Go into classic mode here. Takes a second to load sometimes, I noticed. And we go to networks. Create new network. And we have the site-to-site -site VPN there. Remote user VPN. Pre-shared key, WAN2, gate, IT, subness, create radius rules. But this is still the L2P server when you're doing this. I would like to have seen a more robust like OpenVPN or a more advanced server offering inside of here. Now it does have the OpenVPN if you go site to site and choose OpenVPN right here, but it's still beta and yeah, I don't know. It doesn't feel all that great. It doesn't have a ton of features. It doesn't unlock a lot of options. Now, I know someone's pointing out that, yeah, you can just edit the JSON file, but to my knowledge, I wasn't able to find any type of JSON file where you can do a bunch of custom edits and things like that. And obviously, that's not officially supported by their system anyways. Controller-wise, it is running version 5.1.2. 5.12.59. So it's a slightly different version than the 5.12.35 that we're using for most of the other, that's the official non-beta version of the Unify Software Defined Network Controller. But all this is the same in here. Now, one thing I'll comment on, that there are there are not any official ways that I'm aware of, just workarounds or whatever, but I'm not gonna go into that because um, who knows if they'll continue to work based on software updates, but there's no official way to have this device 
managed with a separate outside controller. It's meant to be managed by itself. So I will at least comment on that for those wondering. So if you're thinking about putting it in one of your other controllers, it's not going to happen. You can always get to it through the portal, but it's going to stay right here inside of itself, so to speak, and run inside of there. Then we have user interface tweaking, notifications, uh, elite device support is in here. I do recommend anytime you are making changes and stuff uh, that you turn on auto backup, but it's backing up to itself. So occasionally download the file when you make changes. So you, you know, have backups of things. That's really important. Now let's jump over here to the devices. And we'll look at the Dream Machine itself. So we're going to have pop this out. And here's the Dream Machine Pro itself. Now here's WAN 2. And we can see that we're connected to gig. We can see 192.168.3.104 is the IP address. Here's an overview of the LAN ports on here, LAN and uh, test LAN for the VLAN we set up, what clients are connected behind it, which nothing's actually plugged into it. It's plugged into the Gen 2 Pro switch. And that's why all these ports are empty. There's our WAN 2 port empty and all of these. Now, I'm a little bit less clear on this but when you look at these ports this is all you get profile overrides for negotiation we can switch between vlans so i don't really see a lot of details and let me show you what i mean for example we're going to pull up this and when you take a port any port like this one here let's edit the port you have a lot more features unknown unicast multicast broadcasts um lodp med uh, topology change notification, spanning tree protocol, egress rate limit. So you have more features that show up inside of the Unify Pro 24 PoE. I don't know for sure if those features just not supported on here or just not visible. I'm not, I haven't done a real in-depth testing on that uh, information. So take that for what it's worth. Um, but it is connecting, like I said right here, this works the same and the labeling's the same. So you know what's plugged into what. So pretty simple there. And like I said, there's nothing plugged into this. Okay, we dive into the Dream Machine Pro config here. Advanced, what do we got? You can set the MSS clamping, the ARP cache, echo server. So to know if it's online, it's doing ping.ubnt.com, but it gives you an option to put something custom in there. Services, enable jumbo frame support, flow control, manage device, and common settings, which this is where you used to have to manage some things and they've moved it. So now they have links to things like routing services, firewalls, etc. So you can click here and jump over to the services side right away. Actually, it didn't even bring me there, it brought me back over here. But by going down here to the gear services, that's this page right here. If you're familiar with the older version of the software, those features on the USG used to all be hidden right under there. But now we've looked at kind of the software, got a good overview. Let's do the speed test. Now, if you noticed, like I had said, when we look at the Dream Machine, its IP address is WAN 192.168.3.104, technically WAN 2. So that is that network. And we're going to show you is, that's my address, 192.168.3.9. So I'm going to run iperf 3 dash s as server so my computer is at the same network that the feeds the wan of the dream machine pro that means i have full 10 gig access from my computer to that so no problem there this like the namesake says debian behind udm ip dash a and we've left threat management and everything on so iperf 3 dash e 192.683.9 so it's going from this address here, 192.168.3.132, through the Unified Dream Machine, over to the WAN side, over to my network, and we're going to show you the speed. But before we do that, we're going to SSH into the Dream Machine. Oh, 1.1. All right. This is the Unified Dream Machine that we're logged into. Welcome to UBOS, UBIOS, UBO, say it how you want. UBIOS, the initials here. And this is the Unify software that's running on the back end here. And we're going to go ahead and run top. I'm going to sort by process and move it up a little bit. And for those of you wondering, this is Tmux that I'm doing that with. Um, but right here, so we're going to do this and show what happens. Whoops. 3.9, did I not run it right here? Whoops, I gotta press center on this side. There we go. So iperf-s. 
and we're seeing about 4 gigs, 3.8 gigs of traffic run through. Now note that Sericata here, which is your threat management, is pulling some processor power, and so is KSoft IRQ. Now what the KSoft IRQ is, that's the IRQ handling in the kernel for the system. So that's the Linux method of handling IRQ interrupts. And what that is, is the system has some limitations to just how much each interrupt can handle in terms of bandwidth and speed when it's going across the network. And to give you an idea what the network looks like on this, it's just a standard Linux setup network on the back end. So here's all the different ETH, ETH.10, which is your bridge for your, um, I'm sorry, your VLAN setup. So ETH 10.10, because we have a .10 VLAN. You can see we have a DNS filter at zero, BR10, uh, BR10 and BR0, that's the bridging, and undoubtedly this one here, yeah, this is for the .10 VLAN I created. So you have each of these networks all bonded together like this, and those run across there as a network driver with the interrupts. So let's go back over here and open this back up. And the reason I'm talking about all that is the question of routing. So right there with one, we can see the speed pretty consistent, and yeah, three point something gigs, and those interrupts are maxing out the processor but if we do here we're going to put four four streams uh four there we go so instead of just using one iperf stream across if we do four capital p now what happens is we're getting much more speed now this is where the synthetic benchmark is actually kind of wrong synthetically are you likely to have a single stream on a single device trying to max out the connection. No, generally speaking, when you're on the internet uh, and pulling a lot of data, you're pulling a whole lot of data. You're gonna have a lot of streams with many devices with lots of connections. So the bandwidth is not one person using all the bandwidth or one device. It is usually a multitude of devices cumulatively using all the bandwidth on there. So this actually handles that better than it does a single stream. So when we start looking at splitting into four streams, you see one, two, three, four K soft IRQs kicking off to distribute the workload across the different cores in there to handle the interrupts and handle the traversal of all the data. So when we split the stream up, we get more speed. I want to clear that up because there's always lies, damn lies and benchmarks. And this time the synthetic benchmark actually because single stream, which we know is less likely for real world use case, um, is actually slower than multiple streams, which is a more likely scenario for a real world use case. So we'll do that and let's um, bump it up. I think we can do, can we do 16 streams? Now what happens when you use a lot of streams is the IRQ interrupts are not what's using up processor. It's suddenly Sericata because now Sericata it slows down with multiple streams. So this is where you could slow down again by having so many streams trying to be parsed by Sericata, the intrusion detection system, where it may slow down and you get less speed. It really depends on how much Sericata has to dig into the type of traffic that's on there and try to do assessments of it and apply matching to it. So this is why speed tests are fun to do in the basics, but in the real world, the internet and the amount of things you're running and all the devices make this a whole lot more complicated. Now, the last little thing we're going to comment on here is this. So we'll actually add a dash T190. And that means let's just hammer on this system and uh, let's let it warm up. All right, so this has been running and pushing some data through it. You know, pretty steady here, this 9.3, 9.29 gigs. And... Let's go to the temperature on this. Let's see how much it's warmed up since we started. So we go over here. All right, and we see it's at 37.3. So it ramped up a little bit uh, from doing that. Now, what I did while it was ramped up, I went in the studio and snapped a picture of this. You could hear the fans running, and this is what how many dBA this was at. So still relatively quiet sitting here. Um, I did it from the back. I actually turned it to the side, put it backwards just so the fans are blowing at it. It's quieter from the front. It was a little bit quieter, but the, the fans being closer to the back, and this is where the air comes out and where the plenums are in it. This is as much as it got up to. So it stayed relatively quiet. It stayed relatively cool. And uh, the test is over, so it's starting to cool down. So ramping it up, letting it do that for a couple minutes and 
it really didn't have much effect on it in terms of slowing it down or making it overheat or anything like that. I didn't have any issues. It's been running in the office for a couple of days now, and we've been we let this test run for quite a few times prior to doing this video. Just see if we had any problems with it, and we didn't. Final thoughts on the Unified Dream Machine Pro. There's no off button. I, I bring it up because I, was, I pulled it off the shelf here and just unplugged it, sat here to finish the video. Uh, and I've done it a couple times. Uh, well, one, because sometimes I start with a video, but also because the reset on it. I wanted to make sure just yanking the power randomly because, well, that's a scenario you may run into in a real world, didn't cause it just to get corrupted. And so far, every time I have randomly shut it off, it has completely turned on normally without any issues that's been good but as i pointed out earlier in the video there is the ability to go through and hold the reset button and it has a mode by which you can go into recovery and you can restore that backup file that hopefully you backed up now i'm going to keep this mounted over in my rack here like i said we've only had it for about a week but so far no issues with it it worked really well it worked as described from unify and i will do some future videos on the other features that it has such as the protect access and maybe the talk i'll dive into those at some later date when i have some more things to set up around it. Uh, but for now, like I said, I'll live over here and wait for some more software updates. And if there's some major changes in the next version of the software, I'll probably make a new video about that. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general. Even suggestions for new videos, they're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.